So this morning, the two passages that I'm going to read from, one occurs right here, and then the other one occurs right here. So we have the fall of man, Abraham. You remember the story of Abraham, right? God, God called a man named Abraham out of a place called Ur of the Chaldees, which is ancient Babylon near where Iraq is today. And he said, hey, come out of your father's house. We actually taught about him in our Genesis teaching that we did on uh, Wednesday night. And actually, I think I changed my mind. I think I'm going to do Exodus tonight. We're going to try to do one book of the Bible, and we're going to just go all the way through. And uh, some of them are going to be longer than others. I apologize. I think I got caught up in some rabbit trails and uh, actually went too long. And then I tried to speed up at the end. But the first the first couple are going to probably be kind of longer. But we're going to try, try to stay focused tonight. Amen. Uh, but so the point is, is that we got on Genesis. And one of the things that we talked about was the fact that Abraham's dad, his name was Terah. And ancient archaeology tells us that that ancient idols were known as Terahim. And so we have a direct connection to the father of Abraham, who was the father of faith, to idolatry. The point to that is this, is that God has called sinners to repentance. Amen. God has called those that are born of Adam, born in sin, those that are lost in the midst of a world, amen, to know that there's a God in heaven that loves them and has a plan to redeem them back from the lives of sin and to give them a new life. Nobody knew God. You understand there was no Israel at the time. Does that make sense? There was a bunch of nations that were following after pagan gods. And God called Abraham and told him, hey, get out of your father's house. And I'm going to make you a great nation. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. And through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. He went on to say, through your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. And we know through the progression, amen. I know I say it a lot, but Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel when he struggled with God. Israel had 12 sons who were the 12 tribes of Israel. And ultimately that became the nation of Israel through which we receive Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Savior of the world. And Amen. Paul tells us, he says, look, it's not seeds as of many that, was, that the promise was given to Abraham. But one seed, his name is, it, that one seed is Christ. And we have the luxury to look backwards and see, man, this was God's plan the whole time. He hasn't, he hasn't changed gears. He hasn't done anything different. He promised that he was going to make a people. Hallelujah. And he was going to give a promise. And through that people, he was going to give us Messiah, which means anointed one. He was going to give us Jesus. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. Jesus became flesh died on the cross and set us free from our sin. Amen? Well, listen, you know, this, this people became a nation in Egypt. We're going to talk about that tonight. And then they went through the, what we call the exodus. It's a mass exodus, an exit, an exit out of bondage. Hallelujah. And in the same sense, God wants to do that for his people today. You might have been born in slavery and bondage under Adam, but God wants to give you an exit plan. Amen. He wants to give you an exodus out of bondage and into the promised land. Unfortunately, many times we find ourselves like the children of Israel wandering in a wilderness, wandering in the flesh, not really making it into the promised land, but under the leadership of Joshua, the Greek version of Joshua is Jesus, amen, under the leadership of Joshua, hallelujah, he brought victory to God's people and he gave them access into the promised land or we could say into the presence of God. When we skip through Judges, we finally come to the place where if you'll remember, the people cried out, give us a king. You remember that? See, the time frame of the Judges was about 400 years. That was the time frame of Deborah and Barak and, 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 and Samson and Gideon. And they, they were judges. And what would happen is, is that repetitively, you know what the Lord showed me? That my early years of Christianity, and listen to me, it can happen to any Christian. It can still happen today. That many times our, our individual walks become like the book of Judges. And then when I mean by that is, is that the children of Israel would find themselves gravitating back towards the world, finding themselves gravitating back towards the things of the world. And then what would happen is, is that they would become really, they would find themselves in bondage because of it. And they would get sick of it and they would cry out to God. They'd say, God, deliver us. And God would raise up a judge. Hallelujah. And the judge would come in and there would be victory for a period of time. And then the next thing you know, it would happen again and what happened again. But ultimately, they cried out for a king. And God said, okay, I'm going to give you a king. I'm going to give you what the desires of your heart are. And he gave him Saul. See, God, I never wanted Saul. Now, I've heard, and I know I've said this to you all the time. <laughs> God, just bear with me. But, but listen, 
God's plan was never solved. Sorry, if you ever had a preacher tell you that, he wasn't telling you the truth. And let me tell you, I can prove it to you. How do I know I can prove it to you? Well, let's just go ahead. This wasn't part of my plan, but, but, I, but, but I know good and well that some of you sitting in this church have had preachers tell you that God's plan was Saul and that if Saul would have just done what he was supposed to do, that, that everything would have been fine and that Saul's family would have inherited the throne. And I'm here to tell you that is inconsistent with Scripture. And it says in, in, in Genesis chapter 49, I'm, you, can, you can go there, you write a note, and I'm just going to tell you what it said. Jacob, at the end of his life, is giving a prophecy to his boys. Genesis 49. In Genesis 49, Jacob is giving a prophecy to his boys. If you want to read it, then you can just go off scroll all the way down in Genesis 49 till you see your eyes light upon the name Judah. Whenever Jacob begins to give his prophecy regarding his son Judah, this is what he says. The scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. The word Shiloh, the, the terminology Shiloh comes means in the Hebrew to the one to whom it belongs. What that means is this. God prophetically spoke through Jacob a blessing upon Judah stating to Judah that the king's staff would not depart from the tribe of Judah until it reached the hand of the one to whom it belonged. What I have to tell you is this, Saul is not the one that God chose because Saul comes from the tribe of Benjamin, and yet when, when David was the one that came from the tribe of Judah, and if you follow the genealogy of Matthew and Luke, it is obvious that both Mary and Joseph come from the genealogy of Judah. So what I want to just say is, is this, is that God has a plan, amen? God has a plan, the people, but listen, the people have a will. The people of God then had a will. The people of God today have a will. Give me a king is what they screamed. And God said, you want a king? I'm going to give you a king. You want something in your life? I'm going to give it to you. But whenever I give it to you, the truth of the matter is, is this. It might not turn out the way that you were expecting. If you would have patience and that you would wait on me. I have a plan. I'm not going to be deterred from the plan. I can still work within your inadequacies. I can still work within your failures. I can still work within your rebellious, stubborn, and stiff neck. I can still accomplish my will for your life. But I'm here to tell you, it could cause you untold sorrow and pain when you demand for Saul in your life. Saul represents the flesh. When the flesh goes after and demands what it is that it wants, the whole time David is waiting in the wings. Amen. God's saying, no, I got a plan and I'm right now I'm preparing him. The guy in his little field taking care of sheep. He's strumming a harp and he's singing psalms to me. I'm preparing his heart to give him a heart, hallelujah, for my people. That he might be able to see that what my heart looks like. How my heart beats for my people. And that he would be able to get a revelation of the love that I have. And this is the one I want to give you. Amen. He's the one I want to place in your life because he represents Jesus. And Jesus will never fail you. I was talking to somebody outside and they said, you know, for the longest time when I first gave my heart to God, I followed after God. And then somehow, some way, I started following after men. I mean, I've told you many times, don't follow after men. Amen. Don't follow after men. Don't even follow after the preacher. I don't care if you think you like him. Don't follow after men. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Hallelujah. He will always be there no matter when you need. He will never do you dirty. Amen. Amen. Jesus loves you. All right. And so what, what I want you to know, though, is this. Is that during the time frame of the kings, even after they get David and then after Solomon. I didn't plan on getting into all this. But after they get Solomon, Solomon does, makes a grievous sin. Uh, and I mean, there's just no other way you can, you can, you can deal with this. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's 2 Kings chapter 11. I'm shooting from the hill. And what Solomon does is, uh, look, he, he builds a two, he builds altars, and he builds one to Chemosh and one to Molech. Now, you do some research on Chemosh and Molech, and you're going to find out that's Satan worship. That's just what it is. And because of that, something happened. God caused the kingdom to split in two into a northern and a southern kingdom. And whenever that took place, there was a succession of kings in the northern kingdom that went after false gods, went after the world. Listen to me, the kings of this world, you, if you believe any politician, and I'm starting to grab, listen, I know, look, well, we got a mess right now. I, know. <laughs> I quit, for the longest time, I quit watching TV. I wish I wouldn't have turned the thing back on, but now it's kind of like I'm stuck in all this stuff. 
Anyway, my point is, is this. I, I tell you, I am sick of the establishment, but I'm going to tell you this too. If you think that any man's going to fix anything, you got another thing coming. He's just going to let you down again. They can talk all they want to, but the truth of the matter is, is that they probably won't do what they say they're going to do. Anyway, the kings. And what happened was, was that Solomon, because of his sin, the kingdom was split. And there was a succession of kings after that that went their own way. And continue to follow after the gods of the world. And what happened was is that God kept sending prophets to warn them. Come back to me. Put your eyes on me. Come back to my word. Come back to my ways. And the people of God would do okay for a while. And then they would fail. And what ended up happening is, is this. Is that ultimately he told them. You're going to come under bondage again. You're going to come under bondage from the kingdom of the north. Babylon. And so in the first psalm I'm going to read to you. Out of Psalm 137. That's where they are. They're in Babylon. The children of Israel have been taken captive by their enemy and they find themselves in Babylon. Then we're going to go back over here and we're going to read something out of Exodus 15. And in this passage of scripture, the children of Israel were captive before to Egypt, but now they've been brought out and delivered. So both of these passages have some common factors to them. And the common factors are both of them surround the concept of a song. Both of them surround the concept of a song and both of them have within them the idea of captivity. In one of the songs, they're in captivity. In the other song, they've just been delivered out of captivity. You know, a song, whenever a song is sung unto God, it represents joy. Amen. Has God ever put a song on the inside of your heart? A song on the inside of your heart regarding God represents the joy of the Lord on the inside of you. You're full of the joy of the Lord. You're full of the strength of the Lord. And God's on the inside of you and he just has to come out of you. I'm not saying, listen to me, you won't see me go around trying to do a whole bunch of singing. And I try it every now and then. I know that I sound bad. That's why I don't do it. But the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that a song has something to do with joy. And when the joy of the Lord is on the inside of you, it wants to come out. Amen. You want to sing unto God. You want to let other people know the goodness of God. You want to let him in. That, that which is in you come out of you. Amen. Amen. In Psalm 137, it says right here in verse 1, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yes, we wept when we remembered Zion. So if you can get a picture of the children of Israel, during this time frame after the kings, God has repeatedly warned them they've been disobedient. And now they're on the side of the river banks in Babylon instead of in their hometown of Jerusalem. Zion is another name for Jerusalem. And it says that they're sitting on the banks and they're weeping as they remember the place of God. Now the place about Zion is that it's a holy hill. It's a holy hill in, in Jerusalem upon which the temple was built within which the presence of God dwelt. So whenever an Israelite is remembering Zion, he's remembering the place where God dwells. You and I, what that means for us is, is that how sometimes we find ourselves weeping whenever we have been separated from the presence of God. We haven't felt the presence of God in a period of time and we desire to be back in communion with him and to feel him. Amen. Amen. And then it says we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. So if you could get a picture of this, this is just like the enemy of your soul. He takes you captive. He brings you to a place where there's bitterness and there's weeping. And then the next thing you know, he says, let me hear that song he used to sing. I mean, you know that song you used to sing when you had all that joy. Why don't you go ahead and play us a song and remind us about the God that you serve and remind us about the presence that you used to so enjoy. And what the children of Israel say in the psalm is, is there as we wept, we hung our harps in the midst of the willow trees. The enemy had stolen their song. The enemy had come in and he had caused them to become captive and he has stolen their song. I don't know about you, but listen to me. This can happen to Christians. I don't care how strong you think you are. The enemy will try his best to steal your song. Amen. It says right here in Exodus chapter 15. This is another song. And I think what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and try to read the passage of scripture. And then, um, and then I'm going to talk about it a little bit after that. Chapter 15, starting in verse 1. 
Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. So God's just delivered them out of Egypt. Amen. Sang this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider has he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength in song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation. My father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host has he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, has dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency... Thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The floods stood upright as a heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. The dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab trembling shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone till thy people pass over. O Lord, till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever, for the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Just for the next 30 minutes or so, I guess, or however long... The Lord says, I'd like to minister to you from the title of Only God Can Turn Bitter into Better. Amen. Amen. In this story, I, as I, the Lord led me to this story, and as I began to read it, and as I began to realize what was going on, the more I read it, I read it a few different times, I started to think about the fact that I wanted to try to visualize it in my mind. Once again, God's people... See, God has a plan, and, and they've been captive in Egypt, which is another type of the world, for 400 years. They've swelled to a great nation, and God said to Pharaoh, let my people go. Let my people go that they might worship me. Whatever it is that you've been going through in the midst of your life, the enemy wants to hold on to you. He wants to hold on to you tightly because he doesn't want to release you. He doesn't want to let you go because he knows that if he lets you go and that you're able to really find the freedom that God has purchased for 
for you that you're going to cause problems for his kingdom. See, the children of Israel were, were producing for, for the Pharaoh of Egypt. They were getting things accomplished for him. Actually, the, the book of Romans in Romans chapter uh, 6 says, Therefore, do no longer offer your members, your body parts, as instruments, meaning weapons of warfare, for darkness. See, the enemy doesn't want the people of God to be set free. He wants to utilize them in his own purposes and for his own kingdom. But God has another plan. And God delivered Israel out with a mighty hand. If you read, if you really do some study, and it's been a while since I've done it, but it seems as though there's a particular spot that they found archaeologically that they believe that Israel was in the midst of whenever this took place. There was nowhere for them to go. You can, you can Google it. What's the likely place of the Exodus where the parting of the Red Sea took place? And there's one particular spot where there's cliffs on each side. And essentially what ended up happening is, is that Israel finds themselves in the midst of this situation. They got a rock wall on one side. They got a rock wall on the other side. The Red Sea's before them. And Pharaoh and his army are coming in chariots behind them. There's nowhere to go. There's no hope. I don't know about you, but I find myself in the midst of situations in the past and sometimes even today where I feel like there's no hope. There's no hope in the midst of this situation. There's no help. But the God that we serve, he does things suddenly, just like he did for Paul and Silas in the midnight hour in the midst of that Philippian jail. Hallelujah. When they turned their eyes off their problems and they put their eyes on the Lord, the earth began to quake. Things began to shake. Hallelujah. Feathers and bondages began to break. And people were released. And I got good news for you. The same God that helped them and the same God that helped Israel on that day is the same God that's here to help you today. He told Moses, raise up that staff and look, the waters parted. The singers of the song said that with the breath of his nostrils you blew the wind that the waters congealed. Oh, come on somebody, that means they got thick. Do you believe it? Can you imagine it in your mind? The water turned into jello and there's walls of water on each side. And the children of Israel began to go through before the armies of Pharaoh. And I don't know about you, but I was just trying to envision this, trying to make it personal for our own lives. Sometimes when we find ourselves in the midst of a situation like this, you know, it's kind of like we're in the midst of a valley. That's what this water has become. It's become a valley, is it not? I mean, the water, the sides of the waters are congealed. The children of Israel are walking through on dry ground. And somewhere in the distance, they can hear the roll, the spinning of chariot wheels. As Pharaoh and his army is coming fast upon their back, they can hear the sound of chariot wheels. They can probably hear the sound of Pharaoh's army screaming threats of murder, screaming th threats of bloodshed upon the children of Israel. What fear must have gripped their hearts? Docile people who have no weaponry, have no military prowess, and instead all they know to do is to trust God, even though the waters are split. Don't tell me in that moment of time when the enemy of their soul is breathing down their neck that they're not feeling uncertain and not knowing what to think. Yes. And at the end of it, whenever they come out, I mean, they step, there had to be a last one. And the last one turned around and he got on the bank and listened to me when he did. The Bible says that the waters, whew, can you imagine how violent and turbulent that must have been? As the waters went from being jello to water again, as the breath of God's nostrils be quit blowing, the waters came. I don't know if you can wrap your mind around it and believe it or not, but I'm here to tell you that the God you serve split the Red Sea. And what is it that he cannot do for you? In the midst of your life. And when those waters came back upon themselves. And I can only imagine how violent that sound must have been. The swirling. The turbulence. And then all of a sudden. Give it a couple of minutes. Everything's quiet. Everything's quiet. And the storm has subsided. How powerful was that? How powerful must have that been for the children of Israel? To see the power of their God. Amen. That nature obeys him. Yeah, I mean, this was not, not, not even a part of my message, but the Lord just put it in my heart. The same goes for the disciples in the boat with Jesus. He speaks to the wind and the seas and they obey him. Amen. Storms going on in the midst of people's lives. The disciples saw it with their own eyes. They saw the storms of life subside in the midst of their own lives. Yet even then, 
they find themselves turning their back on the Lord when they go back fishing. Denying Jesus in the midst of it all. And as a similar occurrence in that story, we have a similar occurrence in this story right here. Three days later. Just three days later. I mean, come on somebody, help me out here. Just three days later, I'm trying to tell you. After all of this, the waters congealed, a valley allowing Israel to walk through on dry ground, the waters turning back to water, drowning Pharaoh, they sunk like lead to the bottom. They're singing a song, Miriam, come on Miriam, get your tambourine. You didn't know they were Pentecostal, huh, Ballard? They were Pentecostal. You won't ever find a tambourine in a Methodist church. You won't do it. I don't believe you will anyway, but I'm telling you, the church I started off in where I got saved, well, look, they didn't have tambourines. I don't know that I want to bring tambourines back, but you know what? Maybe so. Miriam had a tambourine, and all them women had tambourines, and they were beating those tambourines, and they were singing a song unto the Lord. Man, they were excited. Amen. And then three days later. Hallelujah. Three days later, they find themselves in the midst of a situation where they come upon the waters of Mara. I don't know what they were named before then, but after they took that first sip, the name of that place became Mara, meaning bitter. They couldn't drink the waters because the waters were bitter. And they began to murmur against Moses. Three days into the trip, and they're already unhappy. Three days into the trip, and they're already murmuring. I got to tell you something, child of God. You can expect to find Mara or bitter waters along your journey. The fact of the matter is, is this, is that this earth that we live upon is fallen and it is fallen with the curse. The curse, the word of God teaches us that the curse will be removed in Revelation at the end of the book of Revelation. But until that time, thorn and thistle continue to grow upon this earth and there's going to be pain and there's going to be storms and there's going to be trials and there's going to be the bitter waters of Mara. And as soon as you get done seeing that these waters are sweet and you pack up and you get ready to continue on on your journey, guess what? You're going to probably come to some more waters yeah. of Mara before it's over. But I got good news. Because the God you serve, He knows how to make things that are bitter much better. Yeah. The God that you serve knows how to take affliction and circumstances in the midst of your life and bring you to a place where He desires for you to be. I just real quick want to talk to you, really how the Lord originally put this message on my heart, came with the idea of a broken and a contrite spirit. Out of Psalm chapter 34, I want to talk to you about a couple of different passages real quick, because I believe that these waters of Mara were just a first step in bringing the children of Israel to a place where their heart would become broken and contrite before the Lord. God uses these types of things in the midst of our lives to bring us to that place. It says in Psalm 34, this is the psalmist David writing this psalm. I'll tell you the, the, the uh, context here in a moment. But in verse 18, and nine, well, let's read 19 first. It says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So I don't know what you're going through today. I saw Israel. They were up against a, a, a wall and a Red Sea, and God delivered them. Amen. Amen. I saw the disciples in that boat. And they were in the midst of a storm and God delivered them. I saw Paul and Silas in the midst of the stockades in the Philippian jail. God showed up, hallelujah, and he delivered them. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the God, but God will deliver them out of them all. Then it says in verse 18, the Lord is near unto them that are of broken heart and saves such as be of a contrite spirit. You know, the word contrite, it means even more than broken. I mean, you're so broken at this point, the word literally means dust. The point is, is that you've been lowered to the point where you become dust. You, your, your, your spirit has been crushed. Now, some people feel like that's a problem. Well, hold on a second. No, it's not. It, the problem is man's heart. The problem is man's sinfulness. And the, and the man's heart and his sinfulness prevents him from the presence of God, prevents him from gaining access to the presence of God. And it's in the presence of God that we're truly healed. It's in the presence of God that things are truly changed. And i got to tell you right now that a broken and a contrite spirit, he is near unto that heart. And I don't know about you, but I need God. God near unto me. Amen. The context of the story is this, is that God, David's been anointed king. I don't know if you remember the story or not, but he's already killed Goliath, a giant. 
He's already killed Goliath the giant. Saul has already been disobedient towards God's command. And God told him to kill, when he fought the Amalekites, to kill King Agag. And Saul saves Agag. And he also saves the sacrifices for himself. And, with, and the prophet goes to, to speak against it. And he ends up killing Agag himself. But not only that, God's spirit departs from Saul. And God sends Samuel to go anoint one of Jesse's boys. You remember the story? I, I just love the story. I, I, I know I tell it more than I should, but the fact that that's the word of God. So there's nothing wrong with telling the story. Amen. And God, God sent Samuel to go anoint one of Jesse's boys. Now, he warns him before he goes, don't look at his stature or his outward appearance. Man looks at someone's outward appearance. I look at the heart. I don't care how cool you think you look. I don't care how cool you think you dress. I don't care what you think you got going on in your life. God is not worried about your outward appearance. He's altogether concerned about the condition of the internal aspects of your heart. He wants your heart. He wants it humbled and he wants it broken and he wants it contrite that you might be able to gain access to his presence because he loves you and he wants to pour his medicine all over you and he wants to bring healing to your broken and bones, amen? Yes, Lord. And so, God warns them, don't you look at what he looks like on the outside, and they hollered, hey, I, I just only can envision because he's in the field, the Bible says, and he's over there tending those sheep, and I don't know how they did it, maybe they blew a shofar, maybe they had a couple of different signals, and David hears it out there, and he comes running in, the Bible says he's a ruddy-faced boy, he was good looking, he was ruddy-faced, his cheeks were probably red from, from running back in, and he gets to the town, and he sees the prophet there, a little town of Bethlehem. This is a big thing. Samuel the prophet showed up and he's with David's family. And they're about to have a, a dinner for the town. And you tell me this boy just comes in off the out of this out of the field tending the sheep, and he's like, man, what's all this about? Because see, what he doesn't know is this: is that Samuel has already gone through all of Jesse's other boys and said, He ain't him, he ain't him, he ain't him. He ain't him. Surely there's somebody else. Oh, the only one left is the little boy that's in the shepherd field. But like I was telling you earlier, God was preparing his heart. God was preparing his heart for the purpose that he had for him. And all of a sudden, David shows up. And they poured that oil all over his head. And I can tell you right now that Eliab, the oldest brother, he was watching the whole thing. And I know that envy just struck his heart. I didn't mean to get in all this. But I know whenever David ends up going to kill Goliath. Eliab, in the next chapter, Eliab says, basically calls out his, his little contentious, your pretentious heart. Why, why aren't you out there with those sheep in the field? And David says, is there not a cause? Here's this lion giant, this uncircumcised Philistine that's not in covenant with God. And he's over here mocking the God of Israel. And you're just going to sit here and you're going to be quiet. And you're going to allow this. No, I tell you what. Go ahead. Let me find five smooth stones. And with the hand of God behind me, we're going to see victory occur today. Because the God that I serve already gave me a lion and he gave me a bear. And he's going to give me this giant. David's already killed a giant and the, and the women of the town sing songs now because David becomes a powerful warrior. David, Saul has slain his thousands. David, his tens of thousands. And Saul's heart is starting to boil over with envy and jealousy. And then he hears David's already been anointed king. He begins to chase after David and he begins to cause, he desires for David to die and David's on the run. So the context of Psalm 34, I went a little further than I expected, but the context of Psalm 34 is that David is running away from Saul. David is in the midst of a situation, and what I wanted to tell you is that sometimes the afflictions in your life, those bitter spots that God intends to make you better, sometimes they're going to be caused by other people. See, Saul's not doing what he's supposed to do. Saul hadn't done what he was supposed to do from the get-go. What he was supposed to do was... He was supposed to listen to the voice of God, and he didn't listen to the voice of God. And because of that, now David is beginning to suffer because of Saul's choices. The fact of the matter is, is that you yourself may experience some affliction in your own life because of the actions and the decisions and the choices of other people. And I wish that it wasn't so. I wish that people did it right all the time and got it right all the time. And I especially wish that people that really loved God would be able to get it right all the time. But the reality of it is, is that that's not reality. Mm -hmm. 
And sometimes you're going to find yourself in a disappointing situation. And you're not going to know how in the world. But let me tell you something. The answer to this is definitely not what David did. What David did was he found the high priest. He was looking for some bread. And when he went over there and found the high priest, what he did was he asked the high priest, is there any weapons here? Is there not a sword that I can have? And what the high priest told him is, the only sword we have is the sword of Goliath. And David said, give me that sword because there's none other like it. Now you just imagine that. Here David's been separated on the run and he's looking for some help. And he goes and he finds this situation. He shows up at this place. And what do they have? The sword of Goliath. As a young boy in the valley of Elah with the smooth stone and the hand of God behind his back, David sunk that stone in that giant's face and he fell splat upon the ground, took his own sword and cut his head off. What a victory that was that day. And I don't know what got into David's head, but he stuck that sword in the, I don't know if he had a scabbard, I don't know, maybe he probably had to, probably waited down his horse, I would imagine. And he's on his way, figuring out where he's going to go next. And somehow he makes a decision to go to his enemy's camp. He makes a decision to go to the king of Achish, which is the king of Philistia, which is the, the, where, where Goliath came from. And he shows up in the city over there. And the men of the city remember David. They see Goliath's sword. And they say, he's the one that the women started singing about. Saul's killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands. We need to bring him to King Achish. This guy's got some serious military prowess. He took down Goliath. We're about to put him on the front lines of our army, and we're going to let him help us kill his own people. When David realizes what in the world's going on, he kind of he flips out a little bit. Well, he actually flips out a lot. The Bible says, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to freak you out. The Bible says he starts foaming at the mouth. He starts allowing foam to come out of his mouth and he starts acting crazy. He starts scribbling all over the walls and talking out of his head because he's trying to act insane. Because you know what happened? He realized he got himself into a mess. He realized that he went back to the enemy's camp looking for help and that now he's in the midst of a situation that he can't get himself out of and he doesn't really know what else to do. But thank God King Achan says, I don't want this crazy dude. Get him out of here. And David finds himself on another journey. I just wanted to tell you the story, but the main point I want to make to you is that sometimes people in your life are going to get you into a midst of a circumstance where you find yourself in the midst of affliction. And whenever David saw himself in the midst of this affliction, even though he made a move in the wrong direction, what he ended up doing was saying this, many are the afflictions of the Lord, but he will deliver him out of them all. Amen. And then he goes on to say, the Lord is near unto them, which are of a broken heart Amen. and a contrite spirit. Sometimes when we make decisions and we go in the wrong <laughs> way, God just, God knows how to take those things and go from being bitter to better. Amen. Amen. I also wanted to tell you, about Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, chapter verse 16 and 17, the word of God says right here, <coughs> this is David writing, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. So the first context was somebody did you dirty in your life, and it's an affliction. It's a bitter water of Mara, and you don't really, you don't want to drink it. And I don't blame you. It doesn't taste right. And in this situation, it's, the context is sin. There's no question about it. David wrote this psalm after he committed his grievous sin with Bathsheba. After he committed his sin with Bathsheba, and he killed her husband Uriah the Hittite, his own, one of his own special warriors. David purposely set him up. I don't need to go through the whole story again, but he basically wrote a letter to General Joab, and he said, put Uriah on the front lines of the battle. He tried to deceive him and tried to get him to go into his wife and to get her pregnant, and when Uriah wouldn't do it, he wrote a letter to General Joab. Put him on the front line of the fighting where the fighting is fiercest, and whenever it gets bad, back away from him and let him be overtaken. So he's committed adultery, and he's committed premeditated murder. And listen to me, in this situation in the Old Testament law, there was no sacrifice to offer. 
there was no sacrifice for these sins. What you did was, was when you were found out, they took you out into the public and they stoned you to death. And the prophet Nathan comes to him and he tells him the story about the little sheep. You remember that? About the rich man and how there was a traveler coming and he wanted to make a dinner for the, for the rich man. Uh, the rich man wanted to make a dinner for the traveler. And instead of taking one of his own sheep, he took the poor man's one little ewe lamb. And he offered that thing up and he cooked it and he fed it. And when David heard it, he was outraged. See, many times when we find ourselves in the midst of our sin, we can't really see things properly. We're all clouded. And we're, and we're, we're being deceived by sin because it's so deceitful. And David, in the midst of it all, everything's clouded. And he can't see it. But what ends up happening is this, is that the scripture says when David hears this story, he says... Who is that man? Because I'm going to kill him. And Nathan says to him, you're that man. You're the one. See, originally I felt like the Lord was going to have me preach this message. I can't see myself. And what it was going to say is that the word is trying to show you the things that are in your own life. Because you, you don't want to really see your own self. All you can do is see other people. David, up until that point, he couldn't see himself. But whenever the prophet spoke it and exposed it, he was able to see himself. And what he did was... He became broken because what ended up happening was, was that Bathsheba's child died and David began to mourn and grieve. God knew how to get a hold of his heart and how to break his heart. And in the passage of scripture, after he, it's all said and done, he's asked God, he's cried out to God, created me a clean heart, renew a right spirit in me. Take not your holy, take not your presence away from me. And he says, I, if you, if I thought you would desire sacrifice, I would give it to you. But you don't delight in burnt offering. Hold on a second. Don't go past that too fast. Then he says this. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart of God that will not despise. See, I don't know about you, but when I read passages like that, I'm challenged. And let me tell you why I'm challenged. Because I know enough about the word of God to know, no, God does want sacrifices. God does want whole burnt offering. As a matter of fact, he went through a lot of trouble to explain, I speak as a man, he went through a lot of trouble to explain to his people in Israel how he wanted them to approach him. And from the very beginning, he killed an animal and clothed Adam and Eve with the skins of an innocent animal. And when the two altars were erected and Abel brought a blood offering and Cain brought vegetables, God rejected the works of man's hands, the vegetables, and he accepted the blood offering. In the book of Leviticus, he explained the whole burnt offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, very meticulously. God wants Israel to offer up sacrifices because there's no way to get to his presence without the shedding of blood. It requires the shedding of blood because it was a foreshadow a type that was painting a picture to show us that there was a day coming when Jesus was going to die on the cross and shed his sinless blood for the sins of humanity and now whenever that happened the veil was ripped and signifying that we now have access into the presence of God now I got to tell you that David's learned something though and I think that we would do well to try to learn it in this church too as important as good doctrine is, and let me tell you, good doctrine is very important. And you need to understand what the message of the cross means. It's not just that it's an instrument of death, but that it's also that that's where the old man born of Adam dies. And it's also the place where the new man born of Christ is resurrected. Hallelujah. And you need to understand that. And you need to understand that is the entire climax of human history. And you need to understand that the entirety of the scriptures are built upon that concept. But you can know all of that. And if your heart's not broken and you don't have a contrite spirit, Come on. then the reality of it is, is that you just be full of knowledge and, you be full, and you'll be puffed up and it's not a true sacrifice unto the Lord. So in the first situation, mankind has put you in the midst of affliction. In the second situation, your own sin has put you in the midst of affliction. But the reality of it is, is, this, is that God wants to allow affliction to bring you to a place of brokenness and he wants to allow affliction to bring you to a place where your heart and your spirit are made contrite before him. Amen? Amen. One more place I wanted to talk to you about is out of Isaiah chapter 66. <clears throat> this is the last chapter of Isaiah. 
in verses 1 and 2, it says, Thus says the Lord, The heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? Where is the place of my rest? For all those things has mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembles at my word. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed that prayer, that God would make me a man that trembles at the word of God. I don't think that I'm there like I need to be. I can tell you that right now. There's been times that my, my walk's been stronger. There's been times where my walk has, has, the enemy tries to make me waver. But I can tell you that I've prayed that prayer many times. Lord, I pray that you'd make me a man that trembles at your word. That you'd give me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. This passage of scripture is talking about really in the end, the millennial reign of Christ. There's going to be a day when it's going to be all over. There's not going to be any more sin. There's not going to be any more tears. There'll be no more crying. Amen. And on that day, King Jesus will sit upon a throne upon the earth itself. And there will be no sin in the people that serve him. Amen? Amen. And it's going to be a beautiful and glorious day. But Israel, up until this time, had gotten high and mighty in their way of thinking. And now they find themselves about to enter, grow really into Babylonian captivity. Same goes for the Christian today. We, we, we become puffed up with knowledge and we find ourselves thinking high and mighty. And we see ourselves doing religious works. We see ourselves, we're coming to church, we're involved in ministry, we're doing this, we're doing that. And we think that we're helping God build his kingdom. He said, hold on a second. All these things. My, he said, heaven is my promise. Earth is my footstool. What are you going to make for me? What, what are you going to build for me? All these things have been. The hand of God is the one that allows anything to take place. My concern is that this happens in the church. That we get so caught up in, in the doing of what we call ministry. That we forget that our hearts need to be broken before God. And we forget that we need to be men and women that tremble at his word. Amen. Amen. A broken and a contrite spirit, he said. He said, I will look to him. David said he wouldn't despise him. God doesn't despise a person with a broken and a contrite spirit. He looks towards a person with a broken and a contrite spirit. I'm going to close with this. Back to the waters of Mara. The waters were bitter. They couldn't drink them. And the people began to murmur. And God told Moses, throw some wood in it. Throws that he showed him a piece of wood. He said, "Throw that wood in those bitter waters." And when Moses applied that piece of wood, whatever kind of wood it was, to those bitter waters of Mara, the water became sweet. Now you're not going to convince me that that piece of wood doesn't represent the cross. You're not going to convince me that that piece of wood doesn't represent what God has done for humanity. How He gave a promise to a man named Abraham that he would create a nation and that through that nation he would give his son. And that his sinless son would die on a cross and that everything's been done and God is waiting for you and I in the midst of our affliction in the midst of our circumstance to look to that which he's already done. To look to that which God has already offered and to understand something. That the water, the, the wood's already been applied. The water's have already been made sweet. No other person is going to be able to bring you to the place where you're going to find answers for your affliction. Your sin is certainly not going to bring you to the place where you're going to find answers for your affliction. And the reality of it is, is that I don't care how many ministries you're involved in and all the things that you try to do for God, none of that is going to bring you to the answer for your affliction. In the midst of bitterness, God knows how to make things better. And what he does is, he allows the cross to give you access to his presence. It's real simple. The problem is, is that, is this, is that if we've never experienced it, where the presence of God really begins to heal us, there's a good chance we've never been afflicted, like, or we've never truly given in and allowed God to break our hearts. I don't know about you, but I pray that God will keep my heart broken and that I'd be reminded, amen, that I need his presence more than anything else that this world could ever offer.